Hi everybody, um, thanks for having me. I'm Andy, I'm from Stripe. Uh, and I thought I'd uh, try and share a little bit today about um, payment, some cool companies that we're working with, some interesting examples about what they're doing with payment, um, particularly in mind of the move towards payment taking place on mobile. Um, and have a little bit of a thought around together where the future of payment might be. Um, it's always a bit, uh, a bit of a risk when we're talking about the future of something to start staring into the crystal ball and saying, you know, you shall meet a tall, dark, mysterious payment service provider. Um, so I'm going to try and stay away from that and, uh, and, and keep it to sort of you know, interesting examples that might be a bit of food for thought to take back with you today. Um, a little bit about Stripe. Um, we are the best way to take payment online in websites and in mobile applications, focused around making it as easy as possible for our development teams, for engineers to build integrations with checkout, with payment processing. Um, you can simply sign up on stripe.com, uh, create an account, integrate our APIs, and start taking live transactions right away. So we handle everything from security through to daily transfers to your bank account. Uh, just try and keep it as simple as that. Um, We've been launched about three years ago. Uh, we're now in 18 countries, processing uh, billions of dollars per year for a range of companies from the most innovative early stage startups through to high growth technology companies and you know, brands you may have heard of, like in the UK, work with Guardian News and Media, uh, parts of the Virgin Group, for example. Um, so thinking about uh, the future of payment, 2%. So only 2% of global consumer spending today happens online. So if you think about the future of payment online, you know, the obvious thing is this is going to get much bigger. So we can debate about whether that 2% of spending online is going to move to 20%, to 30%, to 40%. Um, but the key thing is we have a huge amount ahead of us. There's another trend, which is the move from payment on desktop uh, to mobile, so mobile phones, to tablets, mobile devices. Um, I think that sits at around, you know, in, in the UK and the US, around like 20, 30% of spending today happens on mobile. And again, whether that goes to 60%, 70%, um, I think it's clear that a lot of spending is moving to mobile, perhaps not all. But the interesting thing is that that is eclipsed, that move to mobile, um, by the move online of spending which currently happens offline today. So that's going to increase whether it's 20x or 30x. Um, so you put these together uh, and we have some really interesting questions ahead of us. And at Stripe, that's something that we're really focused on. We think about how to increase the GDP of the internet. We're interested in not only making it easier for people to buy online through the web, through mobile apps, but thinking about what new businesses, what new business models are being enabled by this, you know, new technologies. Um, so thinking about mobile as the future location for e-commerce, um, I suspect that most people, if not all in this room, will have encountered some of the buzz around Apple Pay. Um, we're really excited about Apple Pay. Stripe was one of the six launch partners uh, that merchants can use to integrate Apple Pay into their mobile apps. Um, and on, uh, we were super excited, actually, that on launch, Stripe was powering about 50% of the, uh, the featured apps in the App Store. Um, but, but what is this all about? And so it's certainly there's a lot of things that are exciting about Apple Pay from a payment perspective, making it easier for consumers, easier for customers, improving the security through things like tokenization so that uh, as a customer, as a consumer, our card information, we take in more control. It's not spread. So when we pay online, our card number is no longer uh, sent to the servers of many different merchants. Um, but I think one of the interesting things about Apple Pay, it's Apple doing what they do well, which is providing a great user experience whilst leaving all of the payment side actually is still run by the existing banking infrastructure, by Visa and MasterCard. Um, so thinking about Apple Pay, it's a great product. And Apple is famed for bringing out great products. But to think about where it's going and how we should think about that, I think it's interesting to take a step back and think about where it's come from. So here we have the Touch ID sensor on the iPhone. Now, this Apple Pay was launched a month or so back. 
the Touch ID sensor, which is integral to how Apple Pay works, uh, actually came out a year previously on the iPhone 5S. And for the first year, the Touch ID sensor was only available to the Apple's provided software. So you could use it to unlock your iPhone, uh, but not much else. And a year later, so this year, alongside the launch of the iPhone 6 and Apple Pay and all these great things, also included in that announcement was opening up the API within the iPhone for the Touch ID, the thumbprint sensor, for use by third-party app developers. So now all of us can build applications that work with the Touch ID sensor. Um, playing it forward, a big part of Apple Pay is the NFC chip for the contactless payments that Apple have included within the iPhone. Uh, and again, this has been released, and this is only possible for use with Apple Pay. It is not open. If we're thinking about the future and where this is going, where will we be if, say, in a year's time, Apple open up whenever it may be, that NFC chip to allow third-party applications to build apps that use that NFC chip. Um, suddenly, it gets even much bigger than Apple Pay itself. An interesting question there. Um, so the Apple Pay experience, it's about allowing, a lot of it for consumers is allowing, make it easier for people to check out online. Here we have the example of Instacart, an app for uh, ordering your groceries from within an app. Um, it allows you to check out, so saves you from having to enter your card details. Uh, and you can imagine, if we're moving to mobile, this challenge of tapping in our payment information into a smaller device can be quite a challenge. But beyond that, it's about making the full checkout process easier. So as you may well have seen, Apple will store um, your shipping address and other information, so it's there ready to check out when you see the Apple Pay button. And you can just press that authenticate with your touch ID, with your, with your thumb, uh, and you're good to go. Um, Instacart, uh, one of the companies that they work with are Whole Foods. So you can order you know, in the US, order your Whole Foods order through the Instacart app. And here, the Whole Foods CIO is quoted saying it's a big success. It's interesting, not just because it's an easier way for people to buy, but a fact that he was uh, quoted saying here just a couple of weeks back is that the average basket size for orders placed for your groceries within the app is two and a half times bigger through Instacart than it is in store at Whole Foods, uh, perhaps due to the convenience, you know, ordering for collection or delivery. Um, so combine these two things, an easier way, a new way to order can be pretty powerful. Um, who's familiar with the game Cards Against Humanity? A number of hands. If you are familiar, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're not familiar, suffice to say, the slogan is a party game for horrible people. Um, Cards Against Humanity, it's a really interesting company. They've got a really exciting story. It's just a card game. Um, you know, so what's clever, what's modern about that, you may ask. As a company, they've built such a strong brand that they were able to move away from the clutches of the traditional ways for retailing online products. So traditionally, you would sell a product such as a card game through Amazon or a big marketplace like that. Cards Against Humanity's brand has grown to be so powerful that they were able to step away. And we work with them. We power their own web store, where you buy their products directly from them. Um, I wanted to showcase them as they're a great example of rethinking what it, what it takes to sell effectively on mobile. So the challenge is, in many ways, the same challenges that we have selling on desktop, but made all the more critically important by the constraints of the small real estate for ordering on mobile. So this is their ordering, ordering screen. Here's the part where you give us 20 pounds. They only request, at the final payment stage, three pieces of information, credit card number, expiry date, and the security code. They don't need your billing address. It's not 1998. Nowhere do they ask for card type, cardholder name. And this is you know, a perfect example of rethinking old assumptions about what do we really need when selling online. How can we make it easy, super easy for people to order um, you know, through the new interfaces where people are currently purchasing on mobile, on tablets? Um, social commerce, it's a buzzword, a buzz phrase. Uh, coined in 2005 by Yahoo. Um, there's been a lot of talk around social commerce. You know, what does it mean? Um, no doubt many people in this room will be thinking about that a lot. Um, it's an interesting time for social commerce. I would potentially put out that it's a bit, we've reached a tipping point. 
where this summer, two of the main social networks, both Facebook and Twitter, announced that they were testing commerce integrated within their platform. Um, so traditionally, if we think social networks are where uh, increasingly our audience, our customer base is spending a large amount of their time. Um, however, the point of sale takes place maybe five, six, seven steps away from, from those tweets, from those posts, from those shares. So what would it be like if the purchase point was available embedded within the social networks, as is now being tested by the networks? So you can see the tweet, the post. Within that, there's the button to buy, uh, buy now. And particularly, you can just, uh, so you can just integrate that with an in-app shopping experience. Combine that with something like Apple Pay, for example, and it become even easier. So what, is, what does this mean? If this is sort of a direction in which commerce is heading, what should we be thinking about? Now, one point is, so perhaps it draws more accountability to the idea of social media. If suddenly it's ingrained, it's so closely tied the link between sharing and awareness and where commer commerce takes place, by removing all these intermediate steps, suddenly, you know, Destination sites, brand zone sites, perhaps take on less relevance as commerce can actually happen closer to where the consumer is. Um, finally, I wanted to run through a few quick fire examples of other interesting ways of taking payment, particularly in conjunction with mobile we're seeing. One, replacing payment at the point of sale. YoYo is a really exciting company based in London here. Um, they, they allow you, they provide a mobile wallet where you can purchase your coffee. Uh, you can purchase you know, your sandwich um, from your phone by just displaying a barcode that's read using the standard point of sale scanner contained uh, you know, at the point of sale. However, and we see a number of companies actually that are experimenting this area. The one key message I had to share there is around the use of payment at the point of sale, not just for payment itself, because sure we can make payment a little bit easier potentially but actually as a method of data collection. So you can collect more information about who our customers are, what they're spending, where they're spending, how much. And this, the most interesting companies that we're working with and we see are using this data. They're using the data collected at the point of sale uh, to do interesting applications around loyalty, around customer analytics, for example. Um, Lyft, you may be familiar with, ride-sharing app, replacing taxis. Uh, you may have taken a Halo here in London or an Uber. Here, I think the interesting thing is not just about making it, you know, disrupting the taxi industry, but from a payment perspective. For a while, people have been thinking about this kind of romantic concept of the mobile wallet and what that will mean. With Lyft, we're seeing an example where it's not just replacing our wallet, but actually where the payment happens on Lyft we don't even take our phone out of our pocket. So whereas people imagine the concepts of the mobile wallet of paying with the phone, with these ride-sharing apps, the question is, how can we make the payment process so transparent, um, so automatic that it, it just happens frictionlessly? And finally, this example that we're really interested in at Stripe is this idea of payments as a full stack. And so beyond taking the payment itself, there are other questions we need to deal with, handling fraud, in reporting and data. Shopify is a company that we've been working with for a while now. Their original vision was to provide everything you needed to sell online. Um, and over the years, they built up a great system for managing your uh, product inventory, creating a web store, processing orders. And it was only last year that in partnership with us, they released Shopify payments. So the interesting thing here is, for the first time, they were able to fulfill their original vision of providing the complete solution uh, that any merchant needed to sell online. And what's interesting is a company like Shopify, their core expertise is understanding the needs of you know, small to medium sellers. You wouldn't have traditionally thought that our expertise would have lied in being a payments company. We're really excited about supporting companies like Shopify who wouldn't traditionally have been payments companies actually providing that functionality to their user base. So this wider context of companies providing payments as a platform uh, I'd be interested to hear, and perhaps later today, if anyone has any thoughts around applications you could think of if you wanted to provide 
or were able to provide payments to your customers as well, whether that's on the supply side or whatever. That's all I have. Thanks very much. I hope that was uh, interesting inspiration, and I'd be glad to chat.